Welcome back to The Dad Chronicle. I'm your host, Alex Albisu. This is episode 120. On today's episode, I welcome a familiar voice back to the show. It's Dr. Jerry Tolbert. I invited Dr. Tolbert back so that we could talk about the upcoming flu season, the role that COVID plays, and some good ways to keep your family safe, especially if you have a newborn like I do. So here's my conversation with Dr. Jerry Tolbert. Dr. Tolbert, welcome back to the Dad Chronicle. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing good, man. It's kind of a stressful time of year, as we're going to be talking about. A lot of sickness in the air, not just from COVID, but also the flu coming in and RSV and all these other things that I'm thinking about with a child under two. Um, And who better to come on and talk about this very important, timely topic than our very own Dr. Tolbert. So thanks for being here, man. Appreciate you. Always happy to help. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Dr. Tolbert has been on the show uh, a couple times. We interviewed him and heard his story. I'll make sure there's a link to that in the show notes uh, below. And uh, there was also a really good conversation about medicine and your kids. And we talked about vaccinations with another dad that we mm-hmm. had on the show, your friend Dan Patrice, also known as Geek Jock Blog um, and the board game guy. Uh, so mm-hmm. he is, uh, so you guys had a, uh, we all had a really good conversation about that. So before we really jump in, why don't you take a moment, reintroduce yourself, uh, to the audience at home in case they're a new listener. Okay. So I am Jerry Tolbert, MD. I, I am an actual medical doctor. I have a specialty in family medicine. Uh, I also have a background in public health. I'm the, uh, private uh, fam- private practice family physician in Kentucky, but I also have a background uh, with our health department, I'm the medical director for the Northern Kentucky Health Departments. Uh, we live just south of Cincinnati, so we cover a four-county area. And I have a wife who just happens to be a pharmacist, so got a pretty solid um, background, some bona fides, as, as it were, as it comes to medicine and uh, population health, which is a big part of what we're dealing with right now over the last nine months, for sure. Oh my God, for sure. So how are you, by the way, dealing with everything? I mean, last we spoke, there was no, we had no idea that there was going to be a pandemic. And, you know, obviously you and your wife are kind of in the thick of it from a medical profession perspective. So how are you guys doing, being able to juggle that situation along with family life? It's been complex. It's not as complex as it has been for other folks, I'm sure. But we've had to make some adjustments in our schedules. We work kind of staggered schedules so that one of us can be with the kids at any given time. And we've had to utilize some childcare through the YMCA. They do healthcare health, um, for folks that work in healthcare. They're doing childcare for them on a regular basis if both parents are working. And so we've really adapted to what's been going on as far as uh, clinically being at work. Our hospital system that I'm employed by does a very good job of keeping the flow of patients appropriate, I guess is the best way to put it. We don't see a lot of respiratory illness in our offices. We have specialized clinics that have lots and lots of protective equipment to be able to do that. And they also have all of our testing equipment. Um, The problem right now, especially uh, with the spike that we're getting in COVID right now, is that the testing equipment is running lower on, you know, we, we, we're low on supplies for testing and we have to make sure that we try to consolidate those so that they're not all spread out. So we don't have one side of the city that's having, uh, you know, massive numbers of testing done and the other side of the city has none. And so the supplies then have to be shuttled back and forth. So rather than doing that, we've basically consolidated and we have a few major test centers set up. A lot of places are doing it that way just for convenience and for you know, safety. And we're much the same. So I see a lot of patients by video. We see a lot of patients in person that don't have any symptoms. Uh, But unfortunately, because of the complexity of everything, you know, my wife still has to be at the hospital. Um, She does 10 hour shifts, seven days on and seven days off. And so she is still uh, fairly insulated being in the pharmacy. But uh, it's... like I said, it's not as stressful as it is for some healthcare workers. We're not on the front lines, you know, holding hands, uh, but we're definitely there as the translators uh, for families who have people that are in the ICU and helping them understand why they can't be in the room with their families and, and things like that. I mean, it's it's complex and it's uh, big and a lot of people going through it. Yeah. And 
tying into something that you just mentioned about talking to those, certainly you're not in the front line, but supporting families who may have loved ones dealing with this right now and trying to put things in perspective, what has been the biggest challenge like when you think about some of these families that aren't taking it seriously or or anything like that, like how do you properly address and <laughs> put it in perspective for people if they may not be taking this thing seriously? It's hard. I will be honest. I, with my background in public health, I am used to fee- and, and primary care actually even i'm used to people not taking things seriously you know we deal with people that smoke people that have diabetes that don't want to take care of themselves for a lot of different reasons and so this is just another one of those things in that line now it's a much more it affects the other people around you much more than it affects you if you get sick in a lot of cases especially uh for the younger folks so a lot of what we talk about in the office is w- with folks that don't necessarily think this is a big deal we we talk about is common courtesy i guess is the best way to put it um you know there are a lot of folks that have questions about masks or concerns about masks and and social distancing and what does that mean working with the health department i've had to do a lot of education with the school boards locally and the the superintendents of the schools and helping them to understand why even though some of our state restrictions aren't as tight as they could be why it's a good idea to be even better than what the state restrictions kind of are requesting. And that's another complexity because we've got a lot of school board folks locally, unfortunately, that are not taking it very seriously either. Um, It's, it's hard to say there's one way to do it. I think it's, it's the big picture idea of we're all in this together. We've all got to contribute. You know, we're doing these things that we do to protect the people around us, not to protect us most of the time. And that's kind of backwards. Most people think about things like wearing masks. They think, oh, I'm wearing this so that I don't get sick. But really, wearing a mask is more akin to washing your hands after you go to the bathroom. The germs that you get on your hands after you you go to the bathroom are your germs. They live in your body, and they're probably not going to hurt you to any large degree. But if you give them to somebody else, they may not have those same germs living inside their bodies, and so they can have a bad response. And so when we wear the mask, we're not trying to keep other people's germs from getting in. It does help with that to a small degree. We're trying to keep our germs from getting out. And when I explain it that way, a lot of folks tend to, as far as masks go, tend to tend to understand what I'm talking about. And, and, and oftentimes, at the very least, they'll acknowledge what we're trying to say, I guess, yeah. um, more so than they did before we started talking. But just in terms of the big picture, you know, people that are saying that this is all a hoax or that it's a you know, politically motivated. There are all kinds of parts of it that are politically motivated. There are all kinds of things that are blown out of proportion, although misreported probably not as much as just inaccurately reported. But, you know, I, I haven't had a ton of patients that have been in the denial phase long enough for it to make a difference because of the speed with which things have progressed over the last couple of months. You know, they came in, we talked about it. I told them, Hey, keep an eye out for the next two weeks and just trust me when I say this. And, you know, two weeks later, the explosion has happened and everybody's reeling from the the case increases and yep. we move forward. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of staggering to see the influx of, of cases uh, being reported. And it's scary, especially for, me just being a little selfish for a second with a three week old, uh, I'm very cautious about who, you know, even within our bubble, (laughs) our germ bubble, as we're calling it, who's able to come over and see Jake and, and take the time to be around him, even with a mask on. I just, we're, we're very cautious of that. The compound that along with the flu and RSV and everything else, you know, that, Mm -hmm. that we're talking about this time of year, you know, I, I think that it's a very interesting um, time of year here in the States and, and, and what we typically deal with this time. You know, before we even jump into COVID, this is, as we know, it's flu season. What, what are some of like the common sicknesses that kids get at this time of year? Uh, first, we'll go there. And then it would be interesting to hear your perspective on how COVID kind of compounds on the concerns that come along with things like the common cold and the flu, et cetera. 
So typically this time of year, the breakdown is is mostly the common cold. You you mentioned that kind of there at the end. Rhinoviruses, uh, adenoviruses, enteroviruses, even coronaviruses got lumped into that for the longest time. Um, lately, we've been seeing more and more of those that are that are a little more complex, so they don't get as lumped together anymore. But rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, and enteroviruses are the ones that cause you know runny noses and and achy bodies and and coughing and sneezing and and mucus production and all of that fun stuff um occasionally uh you know red eyes and and all kinds of outward signs that people associate with illness um those are probably about 50 percent of what we see at any given uh winter time uh about 20 maybe at most percent is going to be influenza uh although that's changed a lot and uh as you said in the context of covid we'll talk about later what that means but we've had a whole lot less influenza this year than we have in past years and the same is true for a lot of our other upper respiratory infections Um, we also see things like rsv you mentioned that that's really important for kids under two Uh, respiratory syncytial virus is a pretty nasty virus that can cause what we call bronchiolitis so the smaller to medium-sized airways in the lung that bring air from the mouth to the lung itself where it's processed they can get inflamed and irritated, and if they get swollen enough, then the air can't get through as easily, and it causes a pretty nasty uh, you know, I- issue with, with being able to breathe. And so preemies and kids under two, oftentimes um, we have some, some pretty significant risk uh, this time of year. Uh, the parainfluenza viruses, those are the ones that cause things like croup, uh, so barky coughs, lots of swelling in the back uh. part of the throat, the upper part of the throat we call the pharynx. And uh, those are typically going to cause more of an annoying cough, uh, coughing so much that you kind of feel like you're getting short of breath, but not necessarily swelling things closed. Obviously, that's the thing that we kind of always hear about or, you know, that your grandparents talked about when you were a kid. But, But the key to most of those things is supportive care. It's making sure that you've got plenty of room to breathe and that you're getting plenty of fluids and plenty of rest. And, and that's true for most of the things that we talked about, but things like RSV and influenza and, and even really severe croup can put small children in the hospital. Uh, so the smaller the kids are, uh, the more likely they are to have symptoms, which is actually kind of the flip of what we see with coronaviruses, uh, specifically with COVID-19. The younger kids under four are having far less severe symptoms for the most part. Uh, versus things like influenza, where kids under really under six years old have a pretty significant risk uh, if they do get influenza of having significant illness. Yeah, that's very interesting. I I actually didn't realize that it was uh, maybe statistically is the best word to use. Statistically, like younger kids, it doesn't hurt them as bad as it does older folks. I mean, you always hear about the risk that it poses older folks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's certainly an issue, um, but that that that's a very interesting point. I, I want to um, steer back to COVID for just a second. Sure. One of the things that I've heard a lot about is this confusion about people saying they didn't die of COVID. Uh, they just happened to write COVID on their death certificate as a cause of, of death. Uh, when in fact it was perhaps more like old age or heart issues or anything. Um, what I, I remember reading and hearing from other doctors that, you know, COVID adds a layer of complexity and, and certainly was a contributing factor uh, to to the death, but it may not have been the primary cause. That doesn't mean that it didn't still play a role. But, you know, thinking about this time of year when sickness is kind of rampant, not just from the pandemic, but from things like the flu and the common cold, what sort of of role does COVID still play in the context that I mentioned earlier? The crux of it really comes down to the fact that you can't tell the difference between COVID symptoms and symptoms of anything else that you just mentioned. And, and that's what really makes this whole process so complex. So a five-year-old with a runny nose could have COVID but they could also have flu or croup or an adenovirus or a rhinovirus or an alternative coronavirus, or they could have allergies. But you literally cannot tell the difference just based on symptoms. Everybody thinks, oh, well, fever is the big symptom. 
that that differentiates allergies from COVID. And one of the most significantly sized studies that we have, it's actually a study out of South Korea, but but in one of the largest studies that we have to date on kids with actual test confirmed COVID, only about 50% of them had fever as a symptom. So it's one of those things where the symptoms are so protean. They're so, uh, there's so many different things that can be associated with infection with a, a specifically with COVID-19 that are also associated with some of these other infections that you can't, differentiate. So everything has to be treated as though it could be COVID, especially if you're going to be around other people. Obviously, if you're around somebody and then you're not around anybody else for for two or three weeks, the chances of you spreading that to anybody else are small. But that's the same with flu. That's the same with COVID. You know, the 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 other side of the COVID um, coin is the duration between infection, exposure and infection and onset of symptoms. It can be as much as 10 days. Uh, whereas things like flu or rhinoviruses, you're looking at somewhere around three days, give or take, for most uh, patients. And the that incubation period is short enough that you start feeling bad before you're spreading around germs. Whereas with COVID, you could be walking around for a week, fully a week, uh, spreading around germs, just more than enough to infect somebody else, and you feel fine. So, yeah. you know, in terms of... In terms of what's the big difference or what's the big, you know, how does it contribute to disease this time of year? One of the things, interestingly enough, and and this, we can kind of get into this if you want, but what it's really done is it's flipped things for us to be able to do some of these isolating measures, the six foot social distancing and the masking. Those measures are actually decreasing the numbers of things like influenza. We've literally seen uh, by typically influenza is a reportable illness. What that means and COVID is the same way. But, but those are illnesses that your lab or your physician, when they see a positive test, they have to report that to the local health department. That is a state statistic that is kept in an actually a na- nationwide statistic in the case of flu and, and COVID. Um, and the nationwide uh, flu reporting system, uh, which is controlled by the CDC and is, is year in and year out done, uh, this year has seen a, a cumulative since September 84 test confirmed cases of influenza. Now, d- does that mean that there haven't been more cases? No. I mean, there are a lot of folks that don't ever get a test. They get a clinical diagnosis. But I can tell you right now, we're not leaning on clinical diagnosis a lot right now because of the risk of COVID. Right. So a lot of folks are getting flu testing. Uh, and so because of that, it is a very, very, very low number of cases over the last year. Now, granted, the spikes over the last few years have mostly come toward the around February. And so we may see some more cases spiking, but to kind of put it in perspective, last year when COVID kind of hit, we were in the tail end of the flu season, but we were starting to see another peak that was getting ready to form over the course of about two to three weeks before we started seeing the massive shutdowns across the country Mm -hmm. when things kind of started heating up. And at the moment those started, the cases of flu dropped to essentially nil uh, and we basically started seeing, and we were testing like mad at that point, even more than we are right now for flu. Why? Is and it, so we stopped seeing a lot of flu. Yeah. So yeah, I think that uh, I didn't really, I didn't really think about something that you mentioned earlier, and I do want to touch on it. You know, the fact that this has the social distancing, the mask wearing, everything like that has helped really limit the amount of the flu that we're we're seeing in other illnesses um that's kind of yeah it's an unintended side effect but of what we're trying to do to contain and deal with covid but you know here we are it's Mm -hmm. doing some some benefit why is it so hard for some people to see this as a thing that we just do and and that we need to (laughs) lean into and handle like do, do you have any sense of this like i'm i honestly have a lot of trouble processing why people can't just go with the flow like let's just do it, guys. <laughs> so if you could answer that question, you would be a very, very rich person because it kind of <sighs> trying. It, it's the key to, to human behavior. Um, you know, the, the short answer that I can give you is there are certain things that we suggest that because it wasn't our idea as a person, we will reject it. Think about it this way. You've got a three-year-old. We were 
discussing the the wonders of having small children uh, in the last few discussions we've oh, had. Oh, yes. And uh, a three-year-old, one of the fastest ways to get them to do something is to tell them to do the opposite or tell them that they're not allowed to do it, right? We talk about reverse psychology. Um, oh, yeah. We, we were just doing that tonight where she was not taking <laughs> the last couple bites of her dinner and we were like, don't you do it. Don't you take those last couple. No, don't you do it, Aria. And she's giggling and exactly. then she takes it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You're not allowed to. You you can't put those pajamas on tonight. <laughs> You're not allowed to wear those. Ugh. Um, it, the reason that works is because our brains are wired for it. We are wired to to especially as small children, we're wired to egocentrism. But even as adults, we we tend toward it. Um, even if we don't like to talk about it or think about it, uh, it's a way that we stay alive. And so it is hardwired into us. But it's something that we have to fight against if we really want to be a part of a community. And and that's the hard part when those two butt heads, um, you know, if everybody around you is normalizing a behavior, it's a lot easier for you to do it. We talk about peer pressure in high schools and we talk about, uh, you know, this idea of, of following the crowd and, you know, mob mentalities and those kinds of things. And, and those are all very real psychological effects. And, and this would be maybe a good one for you to, to talk to Wendy about for sure. But, but I think the key to, a lot of of what we see in the on the patient side comes down to we're really really bad at statistics as human beings and so if i say to you all right well there's a 5% chance that you're going to get this disease if you wear a mask if you if everybody's wearing a mask 5% chance of transmission if you get sick but there's only a 15% chance of it if you're not wearing a mask but everybody else is those numbers in our heads don't sound that different. Yeah. But let's convert them to fractions. So 5%, five, 5%, that's one in, in 20, right? 15%, any idea? Do you, do you, how's, your, how's your math? Oh, I'm getting a nosebleed right now <laughs> trying to think about it. <laughs> so, so 15% uh, is like one in something like 12, I think. Um, so That's a big difference. You know, right. And actually, it I is. take that back. It has to be less than one in 10. Um, so it's one in nine, basically. Yeah. Sorry. I had to see I, now I'm getting difference. math issues. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Doctor. Pff, so this guy, so, but, <laughs> so let's say it's 10%, you know, it's one yeah. in 10, 20%, one in five, Yeah, uh, 20% sounds like a really small number, but that's one out of five people. Um, so we don't, we're not really good when we put it in terms of percentages and, and we have this feeling that, that as human beings, that when somebody says something like that, that there's this 15% chance or there's this 10% chance that, oh, well, that's not a big deal because it's not a big number, and so we move on. Our brains just kind of file that away because it's not an immediate risk. It's not going to be me because it's never me. And even if it is me, I'm in a situation where I'm not going to be the unlucky one. And, and, and you know, most of the time that, that helps us to do things, to take risks that, that yep. may lead to us being able to you know, do things like reproduce. That's why it works. That's why it's stick, stuck around for so many thousands of years. Um, yep. But but the the downside obviously is it makes us less it makes us more hesitant i guess the best way to put it to believe something that we just see if we're not really experiencing it at the time it's why we're it's why we choose a donut over you know a a healthier breakfast it's why we uh you know jump off of of tall objects <laughs> with really small parachutes uh it's why we gamble in las vegas i mean it's it's you know, we, we have this feeling that it's not going to be me or that I'm I'm lucky or that, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm the bending the, the will of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. This is, and that's a lot of centrism around, you know, everybody's the hero of their own story, et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. It's very it's a very interesting, you know, dynamic with the human race where especially at this point where we kind of need everybody to just chip in, do your part. And you see people fighting it. Just come on, guys. Come on. So. Anyway, just kind of steering the conversation back now to thinking about your kids and how we're handling COVID and the flu and all these other things. So what are some of the ways that these sicknesses are being handled today versus perhaps like in the past where we didn't have a pandemic? What what should parents kind of expect going to their doctors? Two big things, and we've kind of already touched on them in passing as we talked about this. The first is you can't tell the difference between COVID symptoms and head cold symptoms, especially in smaller kids, but even all the way up through high school. If your kid has any kind of upper respiratory symptoms and the upper respiratory tract extends from the tip of your nose to the, to the bronchioles that we were talking about earlier, 
So anything you can think of that falls under that heading of flu-like symptoms, plus a few other things like conjunctivitis or, or pink eye, uh, those types of things, diarrhea, those are all symptoms of COVID. Uh, everybody talks about loss of smell, loss of taste. Those are very common, more so in, in folks over the age of, of 15 to 20, but they're still present. And so if your kid, anywhere in that range, uh, from newborn to 20 years old has upper respiratory symptoms, they need to be tested for COVID. And that's one of the things that we aren't doing enough of right now. And it's why some of these numbers don't look as bad for kids is because kids are having these sort of mild upper respiratory symptoms and we're not testing them. And so the, the numbers of tests in kids are a lot lower than they would be in adults. And so we don't always know if we're getting asymptomatic spread that's being associated with kids. So there's this assumption that we're not getting a lot of cases in kids. And I hope that that's true, but it's an assumption. It's not based on hard right. science. So test if you got a question. The other big thing is making sure that you let your doctor know beforehand uh, about some of those symptoms. And if you're going to be around other people, just give it a break and let those things kind of Get an answer, I guess, is the best way to put it, before you go into a situation where you could be putting somebody at risk. So if if your four-year-old is having runny nose symptoms, take a day, take two days. Don't go see grandma and grandpa right away uh, if that's going on. Give it time to kind of either either fill out or go away before you really start getting into these social situations where you could be spreading something else. And that goes for influenza, that goes for COVID, that goes for you know, croup, those are all viruses that adults can get too. Uh, influenza, of course, being probably one of the more common adult things, especially, you know, it's, it's the, we talk about COVID being more unipolar over age 60, whereas these others are more bipolar. The, the young, the very young and the very old both get affected very, very, very strongly by influenza. And then you've got a unipolar on the other end with RSV. So the very young uh, RSV becomes a much more prominent uh, concern. And so depending on the age of the kid, watch for symptoms. If you see the symptoms, talk to your doctor about it. Even if there isn't any fever, still making sure that there's no evidence of COVID is a really good idea. It's, it's not only just peace of mind, but your overall risk as a parent is also higher of getting complications yep. or other symptoms than your kids would be. And so, and there are still actually some pretty scary things that happen in, in very rare instances with kids with COVID. Um, we're still seeing some vascular uh, changes. You know, the, most, of the, most of the bad stuff that happens with COVID, even in adults, a large proportion of it is related to blood vessel disease problems. It's, it's related to blood clotting. It's related, you know, we see more heart attacks and strokes and blood clots in the lungs. Uh, that's going on in a lot of these folks that have COVID. The ones that are really, really, really sick Almost every single one of them has those things going on, and they're happening because the virus is causing such damage to the to the blood vessels. And so, because of that, we can see an analogous kind of of disease process that happens in kids. And so, it's not just a benign thing for for every kid. Right. So, so paying attention to it is important. Right. Uh, that that's very enlightening. Um, because uh, I think you just dropped a lot of knowledge that I, I didn't really think about, you know, I knew that people with heart issues and blood issues, or I'm sorry, you know, issues with their blood vessels, that, that was, that was an issue, but you just kind of put it in layman's terms in a way that I was kind of able to be like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. Here's, you know, like so much on the news and people talking mm -hmm. about it where it just kind of like, okay. Okay. So it sounds bad. Yeah. It sounds bad. Okay. <laughs> you don't really, right. it, it you don't need to know the degree of bad. Bad is good enough. Yeah. Right? Bad is good um, enough, but you just kind of it, added a, a bit more context that was helpful for me. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a complex thing. And the more we learn, the better we can answer those questions. Yeah. A very, so I have my, I did most of my master's in public health in epidemiology and biostatistics. And at the very beginning of all this, some very wise folks, some very folks in epidemiology that I trust said it would be about 18 months before we really came down to a good solid answer, that we had enough data to really talk about this cogently, and that we would start seeing a turn if we were going to have things like vaccines ready and such. And so that is, you know, that's all coming to fruition slowly, but this is month 10 and we're still about six months away. So yeah. Very early on, we've been talking about this as something that was going to take a very, very long time. And 
now in this 10th month, we are actually more able to discuss it cogently, but we still have so much farther to go. And I think that's the hard part for a lot of folks to to get their heads around because we're used to things being wrapped up in 45 minutes at the end of our episode of Grey's Anatomy. And, and that's not the way that medicine works, unfortunately. And that's, you know, if you've ever been a patient in a long-term situation or with a chronic disease, you understand that a lot better. But, but you know, the general public who doesn't have to deal with a lot of these things, they see it as, well, it's, you know, it's science. You do this lab, you do this test, you get this answer, and that's what you get. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that doesn't work that way. This is not Scrubs right. or Grey's Anatomy or I don't know, right. insert or Star ER Trek. Or <laughs> oh, I can't man. wave my magic. I can't wave my magic digital wand over you and tell you exactly what's wrong. Yeah, like I like uh, you know I've been watching a lot of the Next Generation just because uh, for no apparent reason other than uh, I wanted to. <laughs> it's a good um, escape. <laughs> yeah, and you know you see Doctor Crusher waving her little wand around the person. Okay, your broken shoulder is no longer broken anymore, and they're just waving their shoulder around. You're like, wow, what? How do we get to that point, right? Jerry? How do we get to that point? Do you have an answer? Time. The, the answer right. is time. I mean, right. and, and and we will get there. That kind of stuff is based in reality. I mean, even at the time they were talking about it, it was theoretical, but and we're closer to it. You know, we have ways of growing bone on an artificial scaffolding. You can 3D print organs now. There's all kinds of stuff that we couldn't do 10 years ago that we can do now. And 10 years from now, it will probably be even more uh, complex and and better fleshed out. But it takes time. And that's the one thing, especially with this pandemic, that we haven't, people just haven't, they, it, nobody wants to take that time. They want it to be over with. And I get that. Trust me, I want it to be over with too. If I could snap my fingers and end it, I would. I'm not enjoying being in the middle of it. Yep. But at the same time, that, that academic knowledge that it is going to, you can't speed up real time. And the only yep. way to find things out is to, to measure at that point. So we can't say that you don't have a problem six months later if it hasn't been around for six months. Right. And that's really what we were running into and still running into. We don't know, like, not to transition topics, but with the vaccine, you know, so Pfizer next week is going to have FDA, uh, the, the meeting with the FDA for approval. Moderna is going to have theirs the following week. And we may be having, you know, 12 million doses of vaccine. So around 6 million people getting a vaccine in the next couple of weeks. And Obviously, children right now are at the bottom of that list. So right. since this is a, a parenting podcast, those are the, the you know, the kids are going to be in the spring or the summer at the earliest at this point. But that vaccine, we don't know how long the benefit lasts, because even if they had started making the vaccine the day we figured out we had a problem, we could only still tell you definitively that that the the antibodies last for nine months or that the immunity lasts for nine months because it's right. not entirely antibody mediated. So, you know, w real time, we can't fake that. We can't speed it up in a Petri dish. We can't, you know, we can, we can project, we can make guesses, but they're just that. They're educated guesses. And until that time has passed, we can't say anything definitive. And that's hard. Yeah, <laughs> that's you hard know, for everybody. We, we had a good conversation about vaccines on this show. And, you know, we, uh -huh. uh, if people have been listening to this show long enough, they know that I'm a big proponent of get your kids <laughs> vaccinated. And, and we had a good conversation about why that's important around herd immunity and everything else like that. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I know that there are people out there who listen to this show who don't agree with me on that. And, you know, if you had to uh, explain the importance of getting a vaccine like this, uh, what would you tell those people as well as kind of um, like, sh should people trust this vaccine? Like, that's just, you know, throwing being devil's advocate. Like, should people trust a vaccine, uh, a brand new thing, um, you know, putting that in their body? So it's not being devil's advocate. It's being wise. Uh, a scientist should always question everything. Now, does that mean that you have to, to not participate? No, but you should always ask the question, is this the right choice? Right. And you have to weigh that against the, the risks and the benefits. You know, you, you, you can't just say, is this a, a good thing by itself? The short answer to your question is, how do you encourage folks to do it? Well, I will tell you right now that most folks aren't going to even have the opportunity to do it yeah. here initially. Um, the, it, even if we have a full 6.2 million, I think that was the number that was quoted, 6.2 million doses sent out from Pfizer uh, right off the bat. That is roughly about... 64, 65,000 persons per state because it's a two-dose vaccine. So we have to divide any supply we get by two. And that's, in, that's basically using 
equal distribution across all 50 states, which is not going to happen. And because we're bad at statistics and and fractions, like we mentioned before, yeah, it's way less people will will be able to get like a lot so, less people than so 60,000 in the state of Kentucky, and that's where I live. So that's the numbers I know off the top of yeah. my head. Five million, roughly five million uh, residents in Kentucky. God, it's like a drop if in we bucket. vaccinate 62,000 of them. That's less than 2%. It's wild. Yeah. And for herd immunity, for, for the group to be at a point where everybody that, that gets vaccinated protects everybody else around them, we're looking at about 70%. So mm. we're talking hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine yeah. that, that have to go out before we're going to get to that point. So because of that, and that will come eventually. But because of that, this first round of vaccines, most of them are going to go, they, they've got it tiered. And the CDC has a great way of looking at this, but it's yep. frontline healthcare workers and high risk patients, people that have ultra high risk. If they were to get infected, they are going to be the ones that end up in the ICU or worse, you know, end up dead. Uh, and so those folks are going to be the first in line to get that vaccine. And what I've been telling my patients, because a lot of them have been asking, even the young, healthy ones. Do, should I get the vaccine? Yes, when it's available to you. But most folks that are young and healthy fall into phase three or phase four, which could be months from now. Right. So let those of us that are in phase one and two get the vaccine, test it out for you, figure out what's going on, find the, the, the negative sides of it, and then we'll report back and let you know if there is a, a, a problem with it or if it's safe to just go ahead and, and, and you know get it. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for... A lot of the folks, you know, the the thirty or forty thousand folks that have been involved in some of these trials that have already tried out the vaccines to see if they work, but it's going to take millions of folks getting it before we start to see the subtle, you know, negative side of things. And, and that's why I, you know, I've even told some of my older folks, older my older patients, you are wise to wait it out. You shouldn't get it right off the bat if you don't have a lot of risk factors because you need to make sure that it's not going to cause trouble that we weren't expecting. Right. Yep. Very well said. I appreciate that perspective. That's really good. Now, now thinking about the parents listening to this show as we mm -hmm. wrap things up, uh, what are some specific takeaways that people should keep in mind as we're entering flu season and compounding all this with everything else going on with covid what are some very practical ways that people should uh, be careful during this holiday season? Also, like I'm thinking about this also personally because you know I got like a little one and stuff. <laughs> right. So like, what should sure. I do? Jerry? So Jerry, tell me what should for, I do for 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 the very small, you know, RSV influenza still going to be very big deal if if the children under two get those those infections. So isolating, especially if you've got kids under 90 days. Uh, we may have talked about this, I think, in the past. Under 90 days, your kid has to go through a massive evaluation if they get a fever. And so febrile illnesses of all types for a three-month-old or less are a big deal. They're a, a spinal tap. They're a lot of blood cultures. They're, you know, antibiotics and, and things that, uh, you know, that most parents don't want their kid to go through when they're 12 years old, let alone when they're three months old. So isolating away from families is not being afraid or not being overprotective it's being smart uh, so under 30 under 90 days uh, for sure you want to keep as many people away as possible if they even think they might have been near somebody who thought they had something going on in terms of infectious disease so upper respiratory symptoms um Above that age, obviously, a lot of the same stuff holds that we talk about for COVID, for flu, and for all the other respiratory illnesses. Flu has more uh, fomite transmission, and that's a fomite is just a, a, a inanimate surface. So, washing your hands, you know, not touching your eyes, not touching your your mouth, your nose, any of the pink shiny stuff, your mucous membranes. Yeah, keeping your social distance uh, outdoors without masks, six feet. Your risks are pretty small, but six feet is a is a good general number. If it's a really enclosed area, if you're inside a tent and there's not much air movement, then you know six to twelve indoors, ten to twelve feet is actually the best way to to avoid droplet transmission. Six feet is adequate for most cases, but really you should be pushing yourselves farther apart than that if you're really worried about droplets. So, family gatherings in tiny spaces with lots of people probably not the best idea. You know, 
with COVID, you shouldn't be doing that anyway. But that's also, if you're not doing that, you're going to protect against flu. You're going to protect against rhinoviruses and enteroviruses and adenoviruses and RSV. Um, and, and then, of course, the mask wearing, especially for kids over four and uh, adults, parents, uh, wearing your masks, even in social situations with family, you know, unless you know and can account for exactly where everybody in that room has been for the last 14 days and confirm that they haven't been around anybody that that has COVID, you really have to assume that they do at this point. Community spread is high enough that that and the same thing goes for flu and and you know all these other upper respiratory infections in that if you're protecting against covid you're going to protect against all those other things right right very well said um that, that gives me a lot to think about with jake and for the folks listening at home if you're in a similar position as me with a little one i hope that that uh helps give you some ideas on things to look for so uh dr jerry tolbert appreciate you being on this show and sharing so much great knowledge and wisdom what you got going on, by the way, these days? I know the last time we spoke, you and Dan had a podcast going. Are you uh, still in the midst of all that, or are you too wrapped up with COVID and everything going on there? Even pre-COVID, we had a little bit of, of stuff going on on uh, for all three of us, because Bridget, uh, our ANTP co-star, was also uh, uh, part of that podcast, and yeah. all three of us had some some life changes going on. So we put that on hiatus for a while. We've been kicking around, getting it started back again and doing some things kind of like what we did tonight. And uh, we'll see what happens with that. That's uh, the Paradox podcast and all the episodes are still available out there. Yeah. Other than that, fun. I am in, I don't know if I can talk about this, but I'm going to, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be on TV's Travis's uh, podcast. His, uh, uh, I haven't, I don't remember what it's called now. The one where we what watch you movies that I've seen. never seen. Yeah, yep, <laughs> what you haven't seen. I've been on it a few times now, so that's good. So, uh, so I'm going to be hanging out with him. But as far as other podcasts right now, I'm not doing a whole lot. Uh, I am uh, pretty busy with both work and home stuff, so yeah. haven't had a lot of extra time to devote. But I'm still around and uh, always happy to answer questions if folks have them. Yeah, very good. How, how would people reach out to you? Probably the easiest way is either on Twitter uh, at at Dr. Tolbert, D-R-T-O-L-B-E-R-T, or on one of the other social media platforms. I use my real name pretty much everywhere, so if anybody's looking, they can find me. Very good, very good. Yeah, and go uh, check out Dr. Tolbert on TV Travis's show. TV Travis has been on this show, and I've been on his show a few times, so uh, he's a good dude. We do a lot of streaming and stuff together, so if you watch me on Twitch, you usually hear that, uh, hear his voice over there, too. <laughs> So, uh, so, so thanks for, oh, by the way, what's the movie that you're watching? Oh, uh, that was what I was going to keep secret, but I'll tell you, uh, we're going to watch Legend. Oh, Legend. Uh, I oh, have not, okay. I have not seen that since I was about six years old. I oh, think that was man. the year after it came out and we got it on VHS and played it and it was on like a 19 inch television. And even that was too scary for me. <laughs> so I, it got turned off after about five minutes. I was so excited oh, to get wow. it because the cover was so awesome. And then... I yeah never made it through so and I've never gone back so too funny man I love it uh well very good look forward to that uh you can check out tvstravis.com I'm just actually let me double check that tvstravis.com I'm pretty sure that's his website yes tvstravis.com for uh for uh, the episode when it airs here in a couple of weeks uh again our guest has been Dr. Jerry Tolbert thank you very much for being on the show my man thanks for having me Big thanks again to Dr. Tolbert for taking the time to share some best practices this time of year. Yeah, this topic has been kind of stressing me out with Jake being born and, you know, there's so much going on, a pandemic, the flu and RSV and like all these other things that I feel like this was, if this was on my mind, there are probably a lot of other parents out there with similar concerns. So I hope that you were able to take something from this. Give Dr. Tolbert a follow on social media. Just search for Dr. Jerry Tolbert. You'll be able to find him. And if you want to write in or ask any questions, you can do so by emailing the dad chronicle podcast at gmail.com. If you found this episode valuable, consider supporting the show. Head over to support where our new Patreon page is set up. 
There are a bunch of different rewards at different dollar values where you can support the show on a monthly basis and get exclusive rewards for that. So again, head over to supportadad.com, hit the follow button, consider supporting even a dollar a month helps a lot towards the operational costs of this show. And by supporting the show, you'll also help us unlock brand new goals and other cool things that we're looking to do here. So take a look at that. Again, supportadad.com. Our website is thedadchronicle.com. And again, if you'd like to reach out to the show or comment on anything that we talked about, feel free to email us, thedadchroniclepodcast at gmail.com. Remember to be good to yourself and be good to others. Take care. We'll see you next time. If you like this show, check out more great content at incastmedianetwork.com.